Hey, 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 what is going on, everybody? Welcome to the Master and Drum Whiskey Room on a very, very special Wednesday night. I think I say that every Wednesday, but every night's special. Every Wednesday is special because we're hanging out, talking whiskey, learning about whiskey, having a good time. And tonight, on top of that, we get to try five amazing blends with, with, with hopes that two of those blends are going to the, uh, get to the final four here. Now, we were going to do two blends, uh, two bolt brackets tonight. But unfortunately, uh, UPS had other things in mind for me. So um, looks like we're going to do one uh, bracket tonight, which will be the left side of the bracket. But we'll get into all that. Uh, so let's say hi to everybody in the chat. What is going on, everybody? Merry Christmas, if I uh, forget to say it later, uh, as we're kind of leading up to the Christmas uh, Christmas day here in about five days. Crazy. Um, let's see here. What is going on? Did you used to do a drum solo for his intro. Yeah, I could, I could hate with that a little bit. <laughs> uh, let's say hi to some folks in the chat here. It's a big night because I think right now Fred Minnick is doing his top 100 uh, American whiskeys. I don't, I don't know how he does 100. To be honest, it's it's mind boggling how he does 100, but he he does, which is crazy. Um, let's see here. We have uh, Saucy Shane is in the house. KCD, Smoke and Firewater, EJ is here, Jeff W is in the house, Joey B, nice to see you, man, Sandeep Chima is here, Chris Buzalencia, what's going on, buddy, William Wiley in the house, uh, Warren Smith, Justin Jenkins, Get Strunk, um, oh, did I say that last week? <laughs> I, you know what, you know what, Get Strunk, I actually cracked it open uh, last night. On Scott's stream, I was I was hanging out with Darrell, and uh, Darrell was on the after stream, and we kind of convinced each other to crack it open, and we did. And actually, I I, I enjoyed it. It was actually really fruit forward, which I liked. Had some good oak to it. Is it still a four or five hundred dollar bottle? I mean, I don't think so, but I mean that's just the prices of Willet these days. But yeah, I I enjoyed that one. It was pretty good. I'm not gonna say I, I disliked it, but I definitely liked it. More than I disliked it. Uh, let's see here. Get strong. Four Leaf Whiskey. What is going on, Stacy? Nice to see you as always. Fellow Columbus Seabus in the house. What's going on, Tim Cornet? Andrew Bergstrom is here. Jeff Perkins, 96 Millie Man. Happy Merry Holidays and cheers. Love it. Russ L's here. Eric Sorry. Yes, round one. We'll get into all that. Danny Spirits is here. Salute. What's going on, Danny? Michael Speakerman is here, of course. Shauna Marie D. Uh, I know everybody was also hanging out over at uh, Hello Again Whiskey Friends. I know Darrell's a little bit nervous tonight. He has a blend in the in the running tonight as well. So it's going to be a fun night. JG is here, of course. Hey, Earl. Grinch's eyes are freaking me out. Yeah, he just looks right at me, dude. Yeah, that's what he does. Uh, Honest Charlie is here. Uh, Zach Butler, Kenneth Rathburn, Adam F. Lance. What's going on, Lance? Nice to see you, buddy. Boston, my buddy in Boston here in the house. Let's see here. Who else? Whiskey knows what is going on, Marty Party. Uh, we have Joe the Sample Guy. Nicholas Slapshot is in the house. Paul P, Mr. Jigs. And I'm trying to catch up to the chat here. Holy crap. Uh, Matthew M, no joke, just traded a Elmer T. Lee that I got for MSRP straight up for a Wild Turkey. I mean, decades. I'm moving crazy for ETL. Still in disbelief. Drinking Wild Turkey Masters Keep now. Matthew, which – oh, you, you said Decades, right? Was that the one? Yeah, Decades is awesome. Yeah, you definitely won in that deal for sure. Andy Smith in the house. He's got a blend in the uh, in the mix tonight as well. Uh, Dr. B, see you. Saw Willow Purple Top in the Wild yesterday for three, 300. Nope. Dr. B, how old was it? I'm just curious. How old was that one? Uh, what's up, Jason? Bottle King on my Jack 12 tonight for the stream. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And that's right. If you're here hanging out, hit that like button. Let's do it. Let's do this. Here we go. Happy holidays, Jason. Cracking an Old Elk Infinity for your stream tonight, says JJ5098. Love it. Gabe C, first timer, first time caller, long time listener. Is that how it goes? Yeah, first time caller, long time listener. Cheers, Gabe C. Thanks for hanging out tonight. Appreciate the support, man. Merry Christmas to you. Happy Hanukkah. All the things. Let's cover all the holidays this time of year. Love it. Uh, oh, is an eight-year-old will it for three hundred bucks? That's actually not terrible. Um, I've seen it worse. I've seen it worse. That's actually not bad. But willets to me are always a try before you buy because those things get real funky. 
Gabe C says, thank you, sir. You're very welcome. Anyone here or try Art of the Spirits? Any feedback? Terrence McDermott, uh, Scott and I did two picks of Art of the Spirits uh, a few months ago. And I'll tell you, the bottle that we picked is probably one of the best double oaked, uh, one of the best double oak bourbons I've ever had. So again, though, they're doing different stuff with MGP. They have some sneaky other mash bills from other places as well, as most uh, non-distilling producers do. But if you find the right one, some of their stuff is unbelievably good. The uh, Master Blender over there is doing amazing things. So I would definitely check them out, Terrence, for sure. Uh, Pappy Van Winkle Family Reserve, $1,500. Um, oh, yeah, that's about right. Any thought on Hill Rock's Solara Age Whiskey? Yeah, I've not really a huge fan of Hill Rock. I like some of their stuff. They're double oaked. I, I, I like the Solara, not so much, but that's me. Um, when is the uh, 13 Colony pick for y'all? That's going to be next month, January, mid-January, we're doing that one. So uh, my local Total Wine was sampling out that Willa 8-year weeded. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that thing is, I do not like that thing at all. I'm, I'm with you, man. All right, so what's going to happen tonight? So first and foremost, uh, Blendagenin, round number, let me bring that up a little bit. Uh, Blendagenin. This is the first round in the Fab Five, uh, the Fab Five, basically the semifinals. There were two rounds that we were going to do in one night. However, um, the second judge that I had sent samples to, uh, the box rerouted to a different address and basically got lost. So I'm trying to – I'm in the, the process uh, of getting that box back, which I did find it. So it now has to get rerouted to the other judge that was supposed to be here tonight. So instead, we do have one of the judges that's going to be chiming in here in uh, in a little bit, uh, which will be really exciting for everybody to see, talk through some um, – all five of these stellar blends that are going to be going head-to-head -head tonight. Now, uh, let's see. What else? Now, I did want to throw this on screen, guys, real cool, uh, real quick. So tonight, we six of blend and get in in the American blend category for the Fab Five. Five blends go head-to-head -head for two spots in the final four. That means another three will get eliminated tonight, which means we get to learn three more – blends that are uh you know the construction of the three blends that are uh, going in tonight now the finals are soon they haven't been finalized yet but the annual fundraiser that i do each and every year for saint jude children's hospital i am also adding nationwide children's hospital to the mix this year uh being that they're local right here in columbus uh saint jude's gets a lot of money each and every year i just thought it might be nice to do something for uh something local for nationwide children's hospital as well which is an outstanding uh, institution, especially for the kids. So if you have a bottle that you would like to donate or anything that you would like to put up for auction uh, or put up for a uh, for the for the uh, for the raffle for people to get their hands on, uh, then just please uh, email me at the mash and drum at gmail.com. Email me at the mash and drum at gmail.com. I'll be uh, sending you a spreadsheet. You can fill in all your all your, uh, your details for what you want to donate. And then uh, we should be ready for an unbelievable fundraiser here at the probably will happen beginning of January at some point. Um, it seems to always overlay into the, into the following year, even though I'd like to get it done before the new year. It's just with all the blends, it just seems to never happen. So um, where I just have to start, start it earlier, but there's just so much content to make all the time. It's crazy. Uh, but yeah, I, I definitely appreciate everybody's uh, support and I, I'm glad everyone's enjoying the advent calendar. I know I keep saying it, but um, it's really been a pleasure to do that this year. Uh, th today's episode, if you haven't watched it yet, I won't do any spoilers yet, but that one was probably the most surprising. Absolutely blew me away for what that was. So I'm going to shut up now and we're going to sip something uh, because we are getting close to Christmas here. This is, uh, since we're going to be trying a couple different ryes tonight, this is the Jack Daniels Twice Barrel Special Release Rye that I got this year. Um, I figured I'd just kind of start with this one. It's not a super high proof. It's 100 proof. But let me know what you guys have in the glass tonight. Cheers. Happy holidays. Let's get it started. It's a, it's a beautiful Wednesday. The age statements are crazy. So they had a 17-year-old rye from them. Yeah, Terrence. I think I know where that rye came from. It's crazy. The stuff that they're doing with the, the actual barrels as well, Terrence, are, are unbelievable. Uh, you'll have to wait a while for Fred to get his palate back for the finals after tonight. Yeah, seriously, Eric. I mean, 100, 100. With, I don't know how he does it. Has he announced any rankings yet? You guys can, if you guys are kind of 
double watching Fred and me at the same time. Let me know what's going on. What is uh, what's Fred got going on? Did he did he announce anything? I'm always curious. Um, let's see here. Hey, Nathan Ashton, it's his first time making it to a live stream. Thanks for chiming in, man. Awesome, awesome. Uh, Woodford Reserve standard 90.4 proof for Richie Z. There you go. Try to barrel pick a written Ross uh, written house rye tonight. Love that one. That's a, those are some great picks when you can find them. Um, who is up tonight for the blends? All right, so why don't we go through that real quick? So if you guys look on the left side of the bracket here, we have Andy Smith, Danny Lopez, Darrell Stewart, Adam Dorman, and Eric Sawyer. The defending champion, Eric Sawyer, will he may be able to get back to the final four this year? We'll see what happens. But uh, as you can see, I updated the uh, the dates a little bit. Week seven will probably be next week if we can make it work, and then a final round will be uh, will be scheduled at some point after that. So, um, yeah, we are we are ready to go. The right side of the bracket there for the following week will be JG, Eric Snyder, Saucy Shane, the Bourbon Jerk, and Shelby Strunk with a wild card addition with Run DMC Kentucky. So there is your bracket. Uh, so real quick, while we're kind of sipping on this and before our special guest comes in, you know, we're going to spend some time. We're going to break down these blends. So I definitely want to get to a couple of news stories that are very important that had happened in the world of whiskey. So first and foremost, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, – the there, there's, there's a big response happening right now when it comes to the amount of taxes that Kentucky distillers are having to pay for barrels. Now, if you guys don't know what happens here, um, whiskey distillers paid over $50 million, $50 million in 2023 barrel taxes. Now, the the blowback is that it, it's kind of an un, unsustainable type of payment that they have to do. Bourbon distillers are making more bourbon than ever. If you go on a recent tour, especially to one of the big producers like Jim Beam, Jack Daniels, the amount of barrels that they're filling per day, per week, per month is astounding. There is so much whiskey being made and barreled that the taxes on this stuff is just going to keep growing exponentially. So um, real quick, this is coming from Whiskey Raiders, great sites that, that I get a lot of news from. On Wednesday, the Northern Kentucky Tribune reported that distillers paid barrel taxes on more than $50 million, as I just stated, a whopping 30% increase over the last year. Though production is at an all-time high, which I just mentioned, and Kentucky currently hosts a record-breaking amount of 12.6 million aging bourbon barrels. The taxes have proven to be a major liability for production costs. So within the past five years, barrel taxes have grown by a whopping 122%, and they're continuing to rise. This is why House Bill 5, a bipartisan compromise signed into law in early 2023, intends to phase out this barrel tax over 20 years. The bill additionally protects funding for schools, fire departments, and EMS services, where supposedly a lot of this money goes from the taxes. Um, though the polarizing bill has sown seeds of division, and some politicians have cited it as putting tax burden on constituents, con constituents, sorry, I said that wrong, those working in the bourbon business would disagree. Um, the numbers were based on inventory reported on January 1st, which were sent to the Kentucky Department of Revenue for tax purposes. Um, everyone recognized the astonishing tax liability dist distillers are facing is unsustainable and would be for any business. So more to come on that. And I think as we see the next few years, as more and more of these barrels are getting filled, but that's an astounding number of barrels that are being filled right now in Kentucky. I mean, and that's not even counting all the barrels that are getting filled in Tennessee, um, Indiana and everywhere else where, you know, they're making whiskey, but Tennessee, I I'm sorry, Kentucky obviously has the most. I mean, 12.7 million barrels is insane. That's like what, like five or six barrels per person that lives in the state of Kentucky? It's nuts. It's absolutely nuts. Um, what's going on, everybody? Richie Z in the house, Karen before the bourbon jerk. Uh, let's see, sipping on a lemon cruller, single barrel peerless rye. Got visiting the distillery. Oh, dang, let's go. Didn't know what side I was on going to be on. Well, Four Roses 135th will get a, a pass mark, I bet. Uh, Rare Bird, Russell Reserve pick for now. Got my blend on deck for when you start. Okay, perfect. Thoughts on, what does that say? Thoughts on Swenson's. Swenson's like the burger place? Um, 
I like the burgers, but I have to be in the mood for Swenson's because they they like to encrust their hamburgers with uh with uh with brown sugar. So it's a little bit of like a it's like a sweet meat like type situation. But I do love their zucchini sticks. I think they have good shakes. I, I dig it. The tax burden is totally sustainable when you consider how much bourbon they're selling. Do you want a different corporate tax structure? Um, I don't see how it's sustainable, Aaron, given the amount of I mean, you're taking you're taking money out of the out of distillers' pockets that they're using for expansion to make more bourbon for the bourbon that people are trying to drink. So it's something's got to give at some point. It's like, yeah, they're selling a lot of bourbon, but they're also aging a lot of bourbon. A lot of these guys aren't releasing stuff as soon as it gets as soon as it gets uh, filled. So they're paying a tax on that every month. You got to you got to realize, like, for every like barrel that they throw in the warehouse that needs another six, seven years before it's released. So they got to pay six, seven years on taxes on that before it gets released. And somebody pays, you know, 30, 50, 60, 70 dollars for a bottle. And most of that goes to the government. I mean, I, I don't, it's not fair. So I think a lot of that, I'm not saying all of it should come out of the pocket of, and go into a lot of the stuff that helps out Kentucky, including, um, including, you know, whether it be infrastructure, whether it be education all that stuff, but that's an obscene amount of money to go into um, the hands of the taxpayers. I'm, I'm sorry, in the hands of the of uh, of the government, you know, within Kentucky. So, especially when half those guys don't even probably even drink bourbon, which also pisses me off. So I'm just saying, if you're gonna if you're gonna if you're gonna make people pay taxes on, you better know what the hell you're getting taxes on. Um, yeah, Josh. Yeah, taxation is the penalty for being productive. Yeah. I mean, I'm a taxation is theft guy. So, well, yeah, well, I, yeah, I, yeah, there's, I would love to see numbers around that, Aaron, to be honest, like what they're selling versus what they're filling, all those correlations and all those things that kind of come in between. I, I mean, to me, that would be fascinating. I'm sure for other people, that'd be boring. All I want to do is drink the stuff, but I get it, but I would really be fascinated to see like how those numbers actually uh, come out. So. Uh, another big win in whiskey. I'm not saying that the taxing thing was a win, but it's something upcoming. The American whiskey uh, American whiskey industry has breathed a little bit of a sigh of relief because the EU has passed tariffs. Uh, I'm sorry, paused tariffs thanks to the current administration right now. Bipartisan efforts have blocked these tariffs that people were worried about coming back into play again, which just was a heavy burden on uh, the the sale of whiskey going across and going overseas. So this is going to be on pause, I think, for another, let's see, this is another 15 months. So there's another 15 months. So it's a, a little over a year. Well, there will be no tariffs and whiskey going back and forth and being sold overseas will have no tariffs uh, levied on that. So um, that's great news for especially craft distillers who just can't afford to have that type of uh, that type of tariff put on their whiskey. So there you go. So a couple of good news stories, which I like. Uh, one other kind of quick one, which is just really a uh, another takeover, not takeover, but another purchase of a big brand taking over another brand is uh, if you're into Irish whiskey, this is Teeling Whiskey. Teeling Whiskey is one of my favorite brands. And basically Bacardi, just became a majority owner of Teeling Whiskey. They aim to take brand to the next level. So Bacardi bought more shares of Teeling Whiskey, making the spirits conglomerate the majority owner of the Irish whiskey brand. Bacardi initially plans to distribute Teeling in six European markets, expanding its growth. The Irish whiskey brand has been experimenting with distinctive aging processes and finishing casks as of late. Uh, Teeling released a 15-year-old Irish whiskey finish in X. Mugi Shochu Japanese spirit cask in July, a month before. They also did a Portuguese oak barrel one um, as well. So just uh, just some more news. This is just going to keep happening. You're seeing a lot of brands that don't have a whiskey under their portfolio get into the game because whiskey is what's hot, whether it be Irish, whether it be Indian whiskey, whether it be American whiskey, whether it be Canadian whiskey, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Whiskey, um, people want whiskey under their uh, under their under their wing, under their umbrella, whatever you want to say, it is a money maker. And speaking of money makers, we have a couple of new labels that I found on the TTB. This one, I would love to get your feedback on, guys, because there's a lot. Um, I got a lot of varying opinions when this one popped up on the TTB. Let's see here. 
Sort of got blue spot, and they have about two cases on the shelf for three hundred each. Yeah, um, the Irish whiskey prices have got. I mean, they have shot straight up. I'm not really sure what the uh, what the reasoning for that is. Uh, Stacy Stearns is in the chat. In the chat, she knows more about Irish whiskey than anything. Stacy, I don't know if you can um, in the chat maybe shed some light on why Irish whiskey prices have skyrocketed in the last few months. I'd be willing to get your uh, willing to get your your take on it. Um, so Elijah Craig on the TTB released a toasted rye. So here it is. This is very similar to the toasted bourbon that they have had 94 proof, but this is going to be a toasted rye. Not sure if I'm in on this. It's really going to be dependent on the price. You guys know, I'm not like that crazy about toasted stuff anymore. I'm kind of over it. I think it does work in some, you know, when it's done right, it can work really well, but I just don't like when people do it just because everyone else is doing it. I think that's kind of my my take on it. But this is going to be all dependent on price for me. If that is higher than 50 bucks, I'm I'm out. If it's if it's like a $40 bottle, a 94 proof of toasted rye, I think Elijah Craig has something there. So let me see what you guys are saying about it. Jason, have you ever tried the Teal and Cash Strength? So the other day almost pulled the trigger. Um, yeah, I've had that one. I love Teeling. Um, the only product I do not like from Teeling is the pot still. Although their pot still was was not great at all. Now I don't know if that has gone up in price, but um, or up in age, I should say. But I was not a fan of that one. Adam Dorman with the first super chat of the night. Super excited for tonight. I love Blendageddon. One of my favorite events of the year. Thanks for putting it together for us, Jason. Good luck to all the blunders this evening. Cheers to a great night. Well, just for that, you get this. I love you. I love you. I love you. <laughs> Cheers, Adam. Appreciate it, man. All right, all right, all right. Uh, Nick Foles, what's up, Mash and Drizzy? What's going on, buddy? No, their cost on those bottles are about two fifty each from the distributor. Yeah, I realize that, William, but I want to know why. I want to. I want to know why it's gone up so much. To the master distiller is American, which makes her stuff fun. But all their age stock is from Old Middleton and their dad's old Cooley Distillery. Yeah, and that's the stuff that I love. The Cooley Distillery stuff that they come out with. So that's when you see those 14, 15 year old casks being used in chestnut casks, Portuguese casks, those Japanese casks. They are using some of that older Middleton and old Cooley distillate. That is just phenomenal, phenomenal whiskey. So, um, but some of their, you know, regular stuff that they make, I think is pretty good. I do like their small batch was a rum finish. Um, I do like their single grain. Uh, so they, they do make stuff under there that they distill themselves. And I think is really good as well. Um, let's see here. $60 or less says he's in says John Verhovnik. Okay. Blue spot at 289. Eric Farrer. Let's see. Toasted rise can be good, but agree. It will be dependent, price dependent, especially given the higher proof of toasted rise in the market. Exactly. Yeah, I'm with you, Aaron. Love single grain. Uh, I'm thoroughly unimpressed by EC Toasted Barrel. Um, not being a rye guy, it's a pass for me, says Jeff Winbush. I'm with you. It's okay. It's a it's a fine, nice little sweet bourbon. I think it gives it a little extra push of like marshmallow. I dig it. Uh, I, I don't go out of my way to, to buy it, though. Uh, thoughts on the JD Special Release Rye? This one right here, it's a... Uh, this is a, a much more sweeter rye than you would expect. This is all like chocolate candy. I wouldn't say it gets to like raisin. Do you guys know like those, uh, what do you call them? Um, the recent, recent chocolate chews. Do you guys know that candy? You remember that candy, the recent chocolate chews? That's what this reminds me of when I, uh, when I sip it. It's, it's got this dark, dense, chocolatey, a little bit of rye spice as well there. Yeah, it's only 100 proof. Mm. Like it almost comes off malty to me. When you get like that chocolate maltiness, this comes through with like that. I don't know, man. There's just something about that. I get Twix from that. Oh, that's a good call out, William Wiley. That's a good call out, man. I could see Twix. That actually makes sense because it's got like that cookie, like that malty cookie note. So a Twix totally makes sense. I could see that. Yeah, for sure. Kelsey Dime is here. Can't wait to see this week's blend again. In. Oh, it's happening. It is happening. Um, Lucas Oppenier is here. What's going on? As long as it doesn't taste like minted wood varnish. 
Um, yeah, this actually would probably be pretty good over some vanilla ice cream. It's really good. Uh, let's see here. Oh, my God. Pop him, don't watch him is here, ladies and gentlemen. The man, the myth, the legend. I miss you, buddy. How you doing? Nice to see you. Uh, Fred just finished flight number three. He's doing well, says Bob Nichols. Okay, thanks for the update. Uh, yeah, keep us posted on the um, on on the ranking. Uh, mine was pure barrel aged maple syrup. Yeah, I think maple syrup is something I got in the very beginning, but I feel like that's kind of dissipated into more of a chocolate for me. I mean, that's for me personally. All right. Yeah, this is. It's like borderline coffee bean now too. Which I know my man Darrell loves coffee bean, right, Terrell? <laughs> All right. Let's get into uh, tonight's kind of feature bottle here, which is the Angels NB Cast Rank Rye. Uh, since we're talking about rye, a lot of people have been asking me about this one. This just dropped in Columbus over the weekend. I was able to get my hands on a bottle. I hated the price for it. It was $300, which sucks. Um, but as far as... As far as what you're getting here, I mean, it's the usual it's the usual stuff from Angel's Envy. It's not age stated. However, this has a different finish than their regular uh, rum finished rye that just tastes like maple syrup. Um, this cast strength rye is 114.4 proof and it is straight rye whiskey finished in sauternes and toasted oak barrels. So you have some toasted oak, you have some sauternes. Excuse me. Yeah, some saw turns as well. I obviously cracked this open uh, last night just to try it, and I got some good flavors off of it, but I really wanted to let it open up a little bit. I think toasted whiskeys just do better with a little bit of air time. Um, that's my theory. I'm sticking to it. But, yeah, an expensive bottle uh, from Angel's Envy. Really trying to hammer home that luxury market, I think, that Angel's Envy is going for. It's very – I look at, like, Rabbit Hole and Angel's Envy, kind of like that same, like, wavelength where they're really just looking for some heavy hitter, uh, high price points on a lot of their stuff. And I just wanted to try their Riot Cast Strength and see what it would taste like, honestly. So there's the bottle up, up close and personal. There we go. Take a look at it. Again, this is the redesigned bottles. It's really nice. Um, something is going on with the Irish whiskey prices. Just saw a red spot for three forty nine. Um, one hundred percent agreed. I just can't, just can't get down with AE special releases. They almost always fall short for me. I could see that. Um, okay, so I'm gonna let I'm gonna let this pour out here. Now, my first impressions last night, I could tell you, um, the, the rye came off a lot spicier than I thought it would that I thought it would. It was it was extremely black pepper on the back end, which I didn't mind. I do like the spice. It's a far departure from their regular rye that's finished in rum casks that basically has no rye spice and is just all candy sweet. This has a lot of black pepper to it. It had a lot of spice to it, which I did like. So um <laughs> Aaron C AEs without the boxes nonsense. Yeah, we lost a couple like like no box for this, no box for the for the uh Angels Envy Bourbon. Um Wild Turkey Generations, even though it came in a Masters Keep style bottle, no box for that one. Then it's like, ah, screw the box. Let's just make as much money as we can. Um I don't know if uh let's see here. Is Four Leaf Whiskey still in the chat? Uh, Nathan, Ashton, those AE bottles are coming through Toledo High right now. So many good drops this week. Yeah, two completely different animals. Power Street Swallows and John's Lane, still reasonable and can kick some spot ass. Phil C., I could not agree more. If you guys are looking for some really good, high-proofer um, Irish whiskeys that have some good age to it, Powers Three Swallows, uh, Powers Three Swallows, and um, uh, John's Lane. John's Lane is probably my favorite, like, go-to Irish whiskey, uh, to be honest. So, Fred just gave you a shout-out. Really? He did? Okay, that's cool. That's cool. Somebody is offering me a 2023 GTS for my ECBP Batch 9 Pirate Bottle. Do I pass on the offer? 
Oh man, that is um that's tough. I don't know. You know what? Let's have some fun with this question. Let's have some fun with this, but let's have some fun with this. I just want to see where you guys are at with this. I'm going to I'm gonna put a poll here. Sure, GTS 2023. Or ECBP nine pirate. I want you guys to vote on which one you would rather have. So when you're voting, you're voting for the one you want. Okay. Let's throw that in the chat and let's see what you get. Let's help him out. <laughs> let's see what he says. Let's see here. Okay. Let's uh let's break this down here. Here we go, guys. Yeah. I mean, right off the bat, you could tell this is a rye. However, one thing I was not getting last night is that Sauternes cast is coming through a little bit. Sauternes is a sweet white wine. Uh, it's kind of a, I think it's a dessert wine. So you're going to get a lot of sweetness from the Sauternes cast. However, what I don't like about Sauternes sometimes is that it could be also a dry sweet wine. So you get a little bit of a dryness sometimes. I haven't, my first couple sips, I really didn't run into that too much with this one. What's up, Carlito Clasco? Nice to see you, man. Uh, let's see. What is the poll at? Oh, pirate. Pirate in the lead. You know what? And uh, if I could just infuse my vote here, I agree. I would keep the pirate. The GTS, I'm sure, is delicious. GTS is delicious always. But that pirate bottle, um, they just don't make bourbon like that anymore. There will always be more GTS coming out each and every year that you may have a chance to get. But Keep the pirate bottles off the table. They are too good to let go. I'm sorry. It's, I mean, honestly, they are some of the best bourbons you're gonna you're gonna ever taste, hands down. I don't care how good people think a specific Buffalo Trace B Tech is. It's not gonna be. It's not gonna be that much better, or it might not even be as better as one of those pirate bottles. Uh, let's see. Reviews on GTS 2023 was it was just okay compared to previous years. Um, looking all over for Jacob's Well 211 review. Come on, man, says Omar. <laughs> Omar, I actually saw that in the store, but I, I got this instead uh, because that was more of the rare release I was looking for. But if there are any hanging – somebody's actually sending me a sample of one, so you will see a review of that one soon. So, All right, let's go back into this one. Now, I was trying to see if there was any – I don't think anyone put any sort of age here on here. Angels Emery Cash Strength 2023. Um, uh, let's see here. I don't think they put a – I don't think they put a uh, – no, that's the bourbon. I want the rye, the rye, the rye. There we go. All right. Let's see here. All right. So uh, blah, 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 blah. Can't see. Uh, Rye coming from MGP. Okay. Ross and Squibb. Um, okay. This is a 95.5 Rye mash bill. Age between five and seven years. So that's the that's the age on it, guys. That's what I was just trying to find. I just want to give you all the info I could. Age between five and seven years. One batch was then further matured in Sauternes wine cast for three years, while the other aged in a combo of American and French toasted oak barrels for six months. So there you go. So those are the details. Here we go. On the, on the nose, I get a lot of bright fruit notes, so I feel like I'm getting some uh, some apricot in there. 
I feel like I am getting some of like those grapey notes from the sauternes, but it's also very caramel too. The mint spice is there. I mean, with that toasted oak, you can make an argument for maybe some toasted marshmallow in there too. The, the nose is actually very sweet, but it, it does get backed up a little bit with some of that spice. Let me go back to the chat here. I want to miss what you guys are saying. There you go. Uh, just picked a bottle of the Hardest Creek Boston. Looking forward to trying it. The Boston's a good one, Jason, for sure. Sagate slaps the pants off Overholt 10. Eric Fire, I, I agree. <laughs> I agree with you. Five to seven years, $300, ouch. Well, technically, if some of it stayed in the cast for three more years, then you – but, again, we don't know which which three- to seven-year whiskey was aged another three years in the Sauternes. Was it the three-year? Because then it still stays at a six-year. I guess they would say if it was older than seven, if some of that older stuff was in there for three years. So, Travis Robeson, cheers and Merry Christmas. Remember that famous line from Pineapple Express, never go full tater. <laughs> The Master of Jason, as for a donation for St. Jude's, does it have to be a bourbon? Mamuka, it could be whatever you'd like. Whatever you'd like, buddy. Any any donation that anybody wants to make for St. Jude could be is is more than welcome. Um, it could be a uh, it could be a um, whatchamacallit. It could be a whiskey, it could be a bourbon, it could be a rye, it could be a scotch, it could be an experience. So it could be anything there. Let's see here. All right. Sagamore 8 or Templeton 10 years? Sagamore 8. Not even a question. All right. Let's take a sip, guys. Cheers. Here we go. I mean, this is very good. It's really good. Is it a $300 whiskey? Probably. You know what? Let's... Let's compare. So these are some of my favorite ryes that I've had this year, and I brought these out on purpose. Um, I love the Virtue Spirits uh, rye that the uh, that Dan and Sean put out. Really funky, different rye. Love that one. But Sagamore Eight, barring an upset in a blind tasting, this seems to be leaning towards my rye of the year. So let's let's do a quick compare. Let's do it. Why not? Man, the Sagamore, the Sagamore is definitely more citrusy, but the citrus notes that you get are combined with like cherry, and I think you definitely get a little bit more oak here. The Angel's Envy, yeah, the Angel's Envy has more of that 95.5 rye, like forward, um, kind of like those, um, that, that mintiness. There, there's a little citrus there too, I think, also from the rye, but not much. Um, yeah, Templeton is is, def is definitely dilly and a little bit minty as well. So um, let me check here. Um, shoot him. Okay. Uh, feels like the market is finally telling distilleries enough is enough on price hikes. Uh, your year-end blind seems to be telling us 250 is about the max any modern bourbon rye is worth. Uh, that's to me, though, Dustin. I mean, it seems to be that way, but I, I feel like distillers are going to keep pushing the limits. As we stated uh, last week, I do feel like the uh, the bourbon market and the pricing market will plateau a little bit, hopefully, in 2024, and we won't see too many other brands going up in price. I think a big indicator is going to be the uh, Russell's Reserve 15-year. Um with the single rickhouse being 300 generations being 450 what does the russell's 15 price point look like uh they already they already raised the russell's 13 price to what 150 now 160 whatever that bottle is uh maybe even closer to 200 so now where does russell's 15 fall will it be another 300 dollar bottle would be up to 250 you know where i think that one will be interesting i think all the different finishes and the rise and everything that that people are going to be putting out Especially when you when we kind of figure out what's going to be the the most popular finish of 2024. I happen to think it's going to be honey. I think we're going to see a honey cask finish from everybody. Um, if we haven't seen a lot already, yeah, you know, that have done honey, but yeah, I mean we'll see. 
All right. So let's try the Sagamore 8. The Sagamore 8 is just so dense and rich. The finish is great. Yeah, I mean, I like that better than the Angel's Envy, I think. Let's go the Angel's Envy real quick here. Yeah, you start getting these funky flavors kind of in between with the sauternes. I feel like the sauternes and the toasted cask maybe are, 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 are at odds a little bit. Um, I can't decide like if it wants to be like whiny sweet or if it wants to be like marshmallow sweet. But I think the combination of flavors is actually really nice. As far as Angel's Envy products goes, this is probably one of my favorites that I've had that they've done. Um, is it worth 300 bucks? No, because... I like the Sagamore eight year a lot better, and that's what uh, eighty to ninety dollar bottle, maybe a hundred bottle, maybe hundred dollars at most. So I think Sagamore really has something special with that bottle. This for three hundred again, this gets into like that super luxury type of bottle, uh, you know, background. But yeah, um, I don't know. Terrence McDermott says I get tons of baking spice. Caramel, some anise, cherry, obviously some peanut, but not too much. Keep revisiting the old overhaul. I think it too. So the thing about the old overhaul where as you keep sipping it, it, it just becomes more of like a bourbon sipper to me. You get more like that nuttiness that you get from uh, from Beam. So is Sagamore 8 going to put out an older one or or is 8 it? Eric, knowing, knowing what they're doing, you would think we'll see maybe a nine-year. However... Remember, Sagamore Spirit was acquired uh, by uh, De Serono. So we don't know what that looks like from their standpoint. Are they going to come in? Are they going to change the whole portfolio, kind of get them going in a different direction? Will age statements be a factor? There's a lot to see what's going to happen with, uh, with Sagamore in the next year. So, I mean, honestly, it has me a little bit worried, but, you know, we'll see. Let's see here. Um, all right, just checking on my judge. All right, I think the Mint Mojito is the sleeper best M and J rye pick of the year since Terrence Scott. It, it is a really good rye whiskey. Uh, Tiller's Bourbon Challenge is very curious. I keep hearing good things about Corbin Cash. Yeah, the Corbin Cash pick we did is unbelievably good. I don't even know where that bottle is. It's probably upstairs because I drink it all the time. I love that bottle. Oh, no, it's right here. So if you guys have never seen Corbin Cash, this is going to be probably one of my rise of the year right here. Um, I, I know it's a pick, and I generally don't put picks in my top 10 bottles of the year. However, this is just too good to leave off. And I don't care if it's my pick or not. I just the some of the stuff that they're doing is incredible. So I'm a huge fan of Corbin Cash. They're out of California. They don't have a giant distribution yet. But if you guys ever come across any of them or know someone in California, I highly recommend trying it. It's a funky, different type of rye. It's not a 95.5. It's not like a Kentucky rye. It's somewhere in the middle. It's funky. It's weird, but it's delicious. So, yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that um, – oh, all right, the judge is here. I got him. I got him. Or her. Who is it? <laughs> uh, let's see here. The Sagamore Amaro is really good. Yeah, Sagamore Amaro is really good. I mean, everything Sagamore does I love. So, all right, last sip here for the Angels Envy. Full breakdown here. See, that sip I really liked. This is very good. This is one of those bottles where if you're willing to pay the money and get this bottle, I don't think you'll be disappointed. You, I think you do need to give it some time, though. Get it, get the, get the rye whiskey out of the neck of the bottle because it's only gotten better as it's opened up over time. The Sauternes has come out a little bit more. The marshmallow note, you kind of combine that bright fruitiness with like that sweetness. 
You get a little bit of oak and spice on the back end. It's a beautifully balanced rye whiskey. It's very good. I don't think it's worth $300. However, if you choose to buy this bottle and you're okay with spending the money, I don't think you'll be disappointed. That's the best thing I could say. I'm, I'm not going to, it's not a bad rye whiskey. Is, is it phenomenal? No, I like the Sagamore 8 year better, but I do feel like you won't be disappointed in this bottle. It is pretty damn good. It's easily the best finish I've ever had on Angel's Envy product, bar none. Not that I've had a lot of Angel's Envy stuff. I've had some of these single barrels. I've had, obviously, the cast strength port finishes and stuff like that. And they've always just lacked a finish for me, which I drove me nuts. This one has a really nice spicy finish. So I think some people will like it. But one warning with Sauternes, because I'm already getting it with this comparison. I don't know about you guys, but Sauternes does some funky stuff when I'm doing a comparison. Like when I went from the Sagamore 8 to this, it tasted weird. But when I just kind of went back to it and had it on its own, it tasted great. So Sauternes to me, at least from my palate, is always something to be a little bit weary of. It's kind of funky and, and different. So um, I assume your Corbin Cash pick is sold out. Oh, yeah, that thing is gone. Once word got around how good that pick was, gone. Um, let's see. Sounds like the leader in the clubhouse from Fred is Larceny Barrel Proof 923. Okay. I could get on board with that choice. I think the... I really liked C923. I'm not sure which one was was uh, where that one was in his in his top. Um, hey, what's up, Adam? Nice to see you, buddy. Brian M says discovered Corbin Cash while visiting San Francisco early in the year and went out on a total whim at the Cast Liquor Store. Right when I opened it, I was amazed and kept saying, "What the f?" Every sip. Yeah, I'm, t I'm, t I'm telling you, Brian, it is a weird and delicious rye whiskey. They're releasing a high aged like French oak. Uh, barrel finish one i think next year it's not going to be many bottles but that's going to be one i'm going to be trying to get here um he might relax with that four roses 135 so did the did the four roses even make like the top like is he ranking these now i'm just jason have you had the old potrero no terrence i'm trying to get a bottle of that everyone is telling me to, to try to find it it's sold out i can't find that damn rye i want that rye um for sure so yeah, Terrence. If it's if anyone has an old Potrero near them that they have in their like in their area, let me know. I want to try that malted rye because I just keep hearing great things about it. I just have not come across it yet. All right. Yeah, for the me for me the Sagamore wins. But this is a really this is a good rye whiskey. That's definitely it'll it'll be a top ten contender. I think. Uh, but when I do the blind, because I will do a a, a, a ten uh, a ten rye whiskey blind here at some point soon, and we'll see how it does. Um, he was talking up the larceny big time. Uh, let's see here, Jason. Oh yeah, old Petrero. All right, guys. I think it is time. So not only will we'll be uh, inviting our special guest judge here in a bit, but we'll be uh, sipping some uh, some different pours with him. Uh, you might already have a clue of who it is. But while I get set up, guys, it's time to get pumped up. And let's say good luck to all the blenders tonight here on Blendageddon, the Fab Five. What's up, everybody? Welcome to week number six here on Blendageddon. Tonight's a big night. Why? Because the first grouping of the Fab Five is about to go head to head. Five more blends going head to head tonight, trying to make it to that final four spot to see if one of those blends has what it takes to be crowned champion for 2023. So tonight, out of those Fab Five blends, we're gonna have two that are gonna make it to the final four. What happens to those other three blends? Well, unfortunately, they head back to the North Pole. If you guys forget who made round one of the Fab Five, we are on the left side of the bracket. We have Andy Smith, Danny Lopez, Darrell Stewart, Adam Dorman, and the defending champion, Eric Sawyer.
All right, it's time to welcome in our secret judge. It's the first time this person has judged Blendageddon. This person's whiskey brand got a lot of notoriety this year, an absolute stellar blender in their own right. Let's find out who it is. Merry Christmas. Let's get this started. Yippee ki -yay, mother. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome in our special guest judge. He is the owner of Maisano's Fine Wine and Spirits and also the creator of the wildly popular K. Luke whiskey brand. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's secret judge, Jonathan Maisano. Cheers, Jason. Thanks for having me on, man. There he is. What's going on, buddy? Not too much. How are you doing? Good. You, uh, you're, you're a little pumped for tonight? You getting ready? Yeah. Got, uh, got all the whiskeys forward sitting here in front of me. So, so, so these blends are, uh, are, are some pretty, you know, a lot of the guys that like do these, the, the this blending competition each and every year, they put a lot of time and effort into this. So I think it'll be really interesting to get your feedback and, uh, you know, see what you got to say about some of these blenders. This is kind of the creme de la creme. We're into the, uh, the, the, the semifinals here tonight and we'll see what happens as we go along. So looking forward to hearing your breakdown of each and every one of these. Well, I can certainly appreciate what it takes to, uh, to blend great whiskey. So a lot, of, a lot of work goes into it, a lot of love, and a lot of tasting over and over again, trying to find the right combination. So, Hell yeah. Um, okay, so before we get into the blends, you sent me some uh, a couple samples here. One of these samples I've been hearing a great deal about, and that is uh, this K. Luke finished in Cabernet barrels, um, which is getting a lot of notoriety. But before we dive into that one, let's dive into – the uh the back seven cast strength which i have not had yet so i'm looking forward to trying this one yeah i can't wait to your thoughts on this one so uh with back seven we actually expanded to 10 barrels in the blend you know so for me from the beginning doing four barrel blends and kind of getting up to 10 now i was a little nervous about scaling up uh but the really cool thing that i found is we're going with larger blends it gives us more opportunity to have more diversity pull from more distilleries more mash bills more age of ranges um you know, more rage of, of just age, age and mash bills and just really gives us a lot of complexity. So I can't wait to hear your thoughts on this batch seven uh, cast strength. See what you think, what you think about it. It was, uh, so is, so when you decided to scale up to 10 barrels, do you feel like that's a little bit harder to blend or you feel like it gets a little easier? Well, uh, a little bit of both, right? It gets a little easier just because of the complexity I can put into it now with more barrels in the blend. But that being said, it's also far more difficult because, it's, it's a lot more barrel components to switch in and out. So um, it just gives me a lot more tools to work with and also a lot more like, well, what if I switch out this barrel? What if I change this barrel? What if I change these two barrels, right? So it, uh, I think it puts even more rounds of blind tasting, even more work on trying to find that special flavor balance and components. Um, but I'm really excited the way this one turned out in batch seven. So do you have a bottle? Do you have a bottle of the Cabernet one hand handy? Yeah. Because I I'm gonna turn this off. I want you to hold that up to the screen so everybody can see how dark it is. Give me one second here. Yeah, it is definitely dark. And you can see there's uh lots of rich red color in there. That thing is crazy dark. It's pretty cool looking. So yeah, I'm I'm excited to dive into that one. What's up? MW is here, prescription bourbon is here. Jay Porter, Fred's, uh, let's see here, um, John Vornick, motor oil, says John. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to get into this uh, seven. So so this is, this is you said, this is the 10-barrel blend? 10-barrel blend, yeah. First time we've gone to that big, so. So I'm actually picking up a little bit of a smoky note on it. A little bit of smoke, and then then I get like that. I'm assuming you had a little bit of a high rye in here, so I'm definitely getting rye. Yeah, so still sticking with kind of our same, you know, um, you know, having some high rye, more low rye than high rye barrels in there, but definitely using that high rye to kind of accent and and bring in that that kind of richness, you know, bring in those spice tones, bring the mouthfeel. Yeah, that smoke note barrel char is starting to dissipate here. It's just it's just getting sweeter here in the glass. Oh, that's nice. 
Well, I won't, I won't tell you what I think. Why you tell me what you think first, and I'll tell you what my thoughts are on it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I like how rye forward it is off the bat. It's got some nice uh, sweet balance to it, but the the rye forwardness to me, at least on the nose, is really nice. I'm going to try it. Cheers, man. Thanks for uh, coming on tonight. Oh, anytime. Oh, wow. That is probably the most funky seal bot, uh, funky K Luke that you've blended so far. It's got a, it's chocolatey. It's got like a chocolatey vibe to it. Is, it, is that something you're picking up on this? Is that something you're picking up on this? I, I think for me, like you kind of talked about that little bit of like smokiness. I kind of get more like, um, like toffee, you know, that kind of caramelized, just wood sugar component to it. Um, but I also get something. I actually had this at a cigar event um, when Michael Keen was yeah. in when we did the uh, Keenan launch. And I actually, mm. like, raspberry cotton candy came out of the cigar pairing. Man, raspberry cotton candy. I'm not getting that yet. This is this is actually starting off in a darker place for me, which I love. I love the spice of it. I could see now where you're going with the burnt toffee. I wasn't getting that in the beginning, but now it's kind of becoming burnt toffee to me. It's a darker um man. This is uh this is a this is a different blend than what I feel like you've blended in the past, but that's not a bad thing. I'm really enjoying this. This is like yeah, so me... yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say in batch seven, I've got some new distilleries in here, you know, one that that kind of gave me this um this kind of like earthy raspberry tone that I wanted to, to blend in. And then there's also some, some really nice aged stock in here that kind of gives you, like you said, some of that barrel char kind of gives you some of that richness, gives you some of that mouthfeel and structure and, and just big all across the palate flavor. That's those the, like those two notes that you just mentioned is what I'm picking up. I'm picking up the barrel char and I'm picking up like that. What'd you say? A raspberry, like a chocolate raspberry type note I'm picking yeah, up. Yeah, chocolate, I mean, a little bit of that kind of earthy raspberry. Yeah earthy, yeah, earthy raspberry. That's a good way to actually describe it. That thing's crazy. That's good. So, you know, so uh, the goal for us in these blends is to keep, keep trying to have different notes, right? I and mean, the whole goal with K-Luke is not that every blend does not taste the same. It's, uh, it's really what speaks to us in the blending process when I put together the initial blends for my tasting notes in the barrels. And then just as we go through the blind tasting, what really stands out to us? What's the most exciting whiskey in the flight? What continues to win those blind tastings for us? Um, and the Kaluk batches, and then again, just the overall against the other, you know, great bourbons in the market. It's really got to stand out and have a lot of complexity. And that's, that's the goal in every Kaluk batch. Mr. Jake says, I definitely find seven sweet and close similar to batch four, which has been my favorite. Um, Jigsy, you've had this. When you first cracked this open, were you getting anything like kind of like that dark, like chocolatey, earthy note? It's almost coming off like a little malty, which is interesting. But now the more it's opening up, it's getting sweeter in the glass, which is kind of nice. Which is what you expect with blends. I mean, blends do evolve. But I agree with that note. He said seven is closer to four. You know, for me, seven has got the fruit tones, the forehead. But four to me is more like dark cherry. Yeah. Seven is more of that raspberry tone. Um, yeah. Maybe even like is. black raspberry, you know, that kind of darker raspberry note yeah this is very cherry i'm sorry not cherry this is very chocolate raspberry to me on the palate i am getting some of those brighter sweet notes but this is this is a darker profile that i really like this is good i'm gonna have to grab a bottle of this if there's any left yeah seal box um they got it a little bit late you know for brian to get his tasting notes get it online so they launched it late so they do still have some available of uh, batch seven and the keenan cab reserve finish um I want to see if uh, Steel Box the project. So, Shared Pour, we got uh, Batch 7 to Shared Pour. Uh, he already sold out. Uh, he was able to launch his a little earlier. So, damn pop ups. Uh, let's see, K Luke. We've also expanded uh, since last time I talked to you. We're now in five states and then the two online retailers. We've also expanded to uh, Kentucky retail and in Wyoming. So, oh, very nice. Well, congrats on that. I know it. Now it's a pain in the ass getting into different states. Try um, to get where people decide to have the whiskey, Sue. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's see. So I'm just looking at the tasting notes. I don't know if you wrote these for Sealbox, but... No, Brian, Brian writes tasting notes. Abandoned bourbon, Brian Banky. Yep. 
Orchard Fruits and Honey is still very much a blast of brown sugar, which I get. Vanilla coated raspberry, I get for sure. Where past batches have been a larger blast of spice, this time it takes a back seat. Caramel dip green apples. And I think I'm definitely getting some green apple in there. Um, yeah, this isn't, man, this is, uh, it's interesting because all this fruit forward like notes that are that are being called out here I, I just can't get past the raspberry and chocolate it's crazy that's nice i love i love how dark and rich it is on the back end of that that's good uh chocolate char chocolate char in the mid to finish and a nice rice spice all the way through yeah nicholas this is basically what i'm getting Kind of like this, like this buttercream in front, like a burnt toffee, chocolate char in the mid to finish, and a rice spice all the way through. That is essentially what I'm picking up on this one, which is, which is good. I don't think it's as fruit forward as maybe it's being described, but I love this dark char chocolate vibe that it's got going on. It's really good. And I think that's the goal, you know, is to have to have some fruit, right? To have some brightness. Like Brian says, green apple. I think I get some of those brighter tones. To me, it's almost maybe like the spice kind of brightening it up. Yeah, um, for me more than green apple, but it's like trying to have some fruit, you know, have some some vibrancy, have some weight, like you said, have some chocolate multi tones in there. Like for me, it's when we create the batches, the goal is to have like all the things we love about bourbon, right? To have yeah. all those notes. And then what you find when you drink it on different days is your palate kind of feels, you know, different moods, right? It, it tastes different on different days. Whiskey is going to show a little bit different, um, but hopefully equally exciting every time you taste it. That's that's really the goal behind the brand. All right, I am pouring the cab finish, this beautiful dark and dusky. So um, Mr. Uh, Darrell Stewart, the Whiskey Saint, has been talking about this one. He's been talking it up to me for the past couple days, so I've been excited for this one. I always love hearing Darrell's thoughts on whiskey. <laughs> yeah, me too. So um, all right, so tell me a little bit about uh, the cab finish, uh, about the finishing barrel, the winery, all of it. So I've known Michael Keenan for over a decade. Uh, my wife and I have been out to the winery a couple times. Um, really like what Michael does. He's up on Spring Mountain, so Mountain Fruit. Uh, the winery's been there almost 50 years ago. His dad started it kind of with a vision that Michael's really been to be able to bring to fruition. Um, his wines are all equally exciting across the board. He puts a lot of love into each one of them, right, just like we do with the whiskey. Um, we, I reached out to Michael and said, Michael, I've got this idea for a special project. I'd love to lay down my bourbon in your reserve cab barrels. And he actually let me purchase uh, the same makeup he does in the in the wine. So half French oak barrels, half American oak barrels. Uh, so for me, I got to taste them independently. It was kind of cool to see as those evolve throughout the year. Yeah. And I tasted them separately before we blended them back together, how different those barrels, the flavors they imparted. So when we created this batch, I knew going into a wine cast, you know, finished whiskey is always is always up and down, right? Sometimes you're tasting the finish overpowers the whiskey. Um, they're kind of all over the place. And uh, for me, with a finished whiskey, you have to have, I think, the right bourbon blend going into the barrel. So I built the blend to be, you know, real broad shoulders, spice driven, kind of big, over the top whiskey. And we actually blended in some Keen and Cab along the way uh, and then let it oxidize for a few days. So we really tried to mimic what we envisioned it would taste like six months to a year down the road in the cab finished barrels. Um, so this blend was spe specifically designed to go in these barrels. Mm -hmm. uh, it took five barrels of whiskey, blended into four wine barrels, uh, and it ended up going in at a year before we decided. Oh, so, that's, so that's interesting. So when you were working on the blend, you actually poured some cab in it just to see how it would react and how it could essentially, what the final product could look like. Right. So once I kind of put together the blends that I felt were the right blends to go into the barrels, then we added a little bit of Cabernet in, let them sit for a few days, let it oxidize. Uh, just like it's going to do in the barrel, right? As it gets hot and cold, pushes in and out of the wood. I really tried to mimic as much as I could what I envisioned the final product to be like. And on the back of the label, you know, it says six plus months. We knew it'd be somewhere between six months and a year ish. Uh, but of course, it's all done to taste. We had to taste it throughout the process and see where it, uh, we're excited about it. I, so, I have I have I have two words for this. Cherry jam on the nose. It is so jammy. It is really nice. Now, the one thing I always get a little bit scared of like finished whiskeys, especially in wine casks, is that the wine starts overtaking the whiskey. Which, you know, I don't like I bought a whiskey, I don't want it to taste completely like wine. But I, I can already tell on the nose here, I'm starting to get 
I'm getting some great, you know, wine influence, but I'm also getting, I think the backbone of that whiskey still in here, which is, which is a good thing. And again, that was really trying to find the right blend to go into these barrels. Um, for me, that was something that's super important because the whiskey, if we didn't feel it could stand up to the wine, then how was that getting part down the road? You know, and again, blending the wine into it early on in the tasting stages to, to make sure it blended correctly. Oh, dude, this is so this is stupid good. <laughs> this is stupid good. This It's like... It's got that funky earthiness to it that you get from the wine cask, but you got all the spice from the that is stupid good. I'm gonna I'm gonna freaking before anybody watches this, which I know they're watching now, but I'm adding it to my freaking cart right now and ordering one. Yeah, man, we're super happy that it turned out. So, you know, Michael Keenan believed in us. Like I said, I've known him for forever, love the wines. Um, you know, Caitlin was born in 2012, where the K comes from K Luke. We have a six liter bottle of his uh, Marinet, another blend he does lay down. And then Lucas was born in 2017. He's got a three liter bottle of reserve cab. So I'm a huge fan of Michael's wines. And uh, he didn't give a second thought when I reached out to him. He said, no problem, man, you can use my name. The likeness was never concerned that I'd, I'd screw it up, you know? And uh, we got together in person a couple weeks ago and did a uh, launch party. We did a, uh, we had an Italian restaurant, we did a multi-course wine dinner, finished off the whiskey over in Louisiana. And then we did a, uh, just had a casual night here on the, Mississippi Gulf Coast hung out with guys, uh, smoked oh cigars, drank whiskey, enjoyed the wine. So. so, so this reminds me a little bit. Now it's a totally different whiskey, but I don't know if you had the New Riff malted rye last year that was finished in a sherry cask, which had these deep, rich, dark, like orchard fruit notes to it, but also had like this funkiness on the back end, like the barrel and the uh, a little bit of. Um, What's the note I'm looking for here? A, um, it, it's like that funky oak note that you get from like a, a wine finish. It's not sulfur by any means because I think sulfur turns me off. I can smell that like right away. But this is absolutely this – is, this is really good. I can see – this is totally Darrell's profile. I can see why he loves it so much. Uh, guys, any of you – like, like I said, you need to – Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Any of you guys watching, if you're interested in, in trying this out, it's available on Sealbox right now. Just look up K Luke and you'll see. Left uh, on there. You'll see the Keenan Reserve, man. Jeez. Uh, can you disclose the age on the Keenan? Uh, Darrell said, I found it to have the funky oak, which I agree, which made me think old, but wasn't sure. I stand by this being my favorite K Luke. Awesome, Darrell, so, man. Cheers. Glad to hear. Uh... Glad to hear you approve. You know, so for me, like we've talked about before, um, we've got some great age stock. You know, everything, bare minimum has to be four-year-old by law, but really everything we look at in the blends is uh, is usually at least five and a half years old. Again, it's all about the flavor. Uh, but now, I mean, now we're starting to get up into that, like, you know, looking at getting closer to not on a double-digit realm. Um, but for me, it's all about the flavor of the whiskey and how it is getting part in the blend is far more important to me, as I told you before, you know, than the age um then the distillery right all these guys at the distilleries are, are masters at the craft they all just sell great whiskey and for me it's what yeah. can i do with these three whiskeys to layer them and make it into something something unique and something uh something complex so yeah that is stupid good dude that is a really really good whiskey i just the flavors the funkiness of it the dark fruit the jamminess it has if anybody out there likes full flavored just I mean, jammy, cherry, raspberry cordial. Um, you, you still get like the dark caramel, maybe a little bit of hint of chocolate in there too. The spice, the oak, and that little bit of funkiness on the back end that just kind of finishes it all out. It's got this sneaky long finish as well. This comes in at 121.6 proof. So it's a it's a proofy beast. It doesn't. This isn't like a delicately crafted finished cabernet cast this is a beast of a bourbon and it is good so yeah get on uh, yeah it's get on awesome. for me on proof wise you knew as far as like outside of my realm you know 115 plus or minus about five points is my sweet spot but i think the cabernet cast really lends well to that higher proof and that full flavored again broad shouldered whiskey um yeah if you didn't hear that kind of robust whiskey i think it would get lost with the cab and the fruit would overwhelm and you wouldn't get that nice long lingering finish, and like you said, get all that richness. Yeah, it it it, de it definitely gives me like those new riff, um, sherry finished, cast strength rye vibes 
with like that funkiness on the back end, but all the rich flavors, the backbone of the whiskey is still there. Well done, Jonathan, man. That's that's okay. good. That's good. I like seven. I love this Keenan Reserve. That thing is stupid good. I appreciate it, man. It's uh, you know, yeah. again, Michael Keenan's a, a great winemaker. I really love what he's doing at the winery. I'm a big fan of, uh, of everything he does. So I had to make sure that the whiskey was going to do him justice. And uh, we got to get together, and I got to watch him have his first pour of it, and he was just as excited. You know, it holds up really well too. If you want to put a little splash of water in there, it kind of brings out that dark fruit, kind of heightens the spice in the back end. Um, yeah, I couldn't be happy the way it turned out. So I'm glad you feel the same way, and Darrell, you as well. So. Yeah, it's so good, dude. It's so good. I can't – it's so good. Um, all right. Well, before I finish that entire sample bottle, I think we're going to have to uh, try some of these blends. So uh, right. you ready for it? Yeah, man. I got them laid out uh, left to right, A to E. So I just – All right, here we go. So real quick, guys. Once again, here is the bracket um, for you. So here is who's going head-to-head -head tonight. If you guys missed it, Andy Smith, Danny Lopez, Darrell Stewart – Adam Dorman and Eric Sawyer all going head to head tonight. Um, so three of these are going to be eliminated tonight, and two will make that final four bracket, as you can see right there in the middle of the screen. So uh, good luck to everybody uh, that's going to be vying for those two spots, and uh, we'll see what happens. So, right. so Jonathan, how the, how this works? We'll just go in order. We can nose them, taste them. Just shout out any notes. Shout out any um basically finish taste flavor profile um complexity also we're also looking for you know something unique as well so just uh kind of keep those in mind and we'll we'll go through them here so good luck to everybody okay man looking forward to it here we go all right let's start with uh, letter a let's see what we got It'll be interesting to taste through these again because these are interesting. Um, man. man, this is this to me is I guess very dark fruit on the news. It's very dark. It's very yeah, you just took the words out of our mouth. It's very dark fruit forward. There's some spice there too. Get some nice baking spice here. Yeah, especially on the finish. It's like you get the fruit up front and then you just get a just a pop of spice. That's beautiful. I yeah, that's a nice blend. Again, that dark fruit note up front, a little bit of spice in the mid palate and the back end. Also, I get a little bit of a funky oak note on the back end of that too. You getting that as well a little bit? Yeah, the, the, like you kind of go back to that like multi thing you mentioned earlier, you know, just a little bit of like um yeah, almost like the cinnamon Twix bar. How you kind of get that, like that, uh, whatever the cookie is in the Twix, that kind of nougat thing going on. Oh my god, nougat! Yeah, or is it? Yeah, it's nougat. Yeah, nougat's the stuff because I can never. Nobody knows what nougat really is, but it's there. It's in like every candy bar. Cookie part with Twix, right? And then for me, you know, probably thirty seconds later, the spice kind of comes back up again, and I kind of really get this dark spice note again. Yeah, I call it the uh, I call it the flag on the play. It's like a late hit. You kind of. Yeah. You think it's done and then it comes back, which I love when you get that in whiskey. So letter A, starting off really strong here. Mm. There is an earthiness to it, though. Every time I go back, there's an earthy quality that it's got. And like you said, I don't know if that's like a maltiness that it's got in it. Is it a product of just... You know, sitting and being a little bit more, um, being a little bit more integrated as it sat in the in the jars, um, you know, the sample jars. I don't know. It's good though. I love yeah. the finish on it. Is the best part. It's got an incredible finish to this bourbon. To this, you whiskey. know, what it's a little bit of. You know, you ever taste whiskey from a uh, from a brick warehouse where it kind of has that little bit of like funkiness to it? Yeah, moisture retention. Like I get a little bit of that too. Yeah, I think that's what it is. It's like there's this weird funkiness to it. It's it's good though. I yeah. again, the finish is the best part. So it's not overwhelming on the funk. It's like it's there, but it's not like you know. That's all you taste. It's just kind of a, a note that's in there. Yeah, um, yeah. 
but it's well put together. I mean, it's got a lot going on, you know, between the fruit, that, that nougat funky. Let's uh, give it up for Dusty Dan with uh, the second super chat of the night or the third. I can't remember. Yeah. Cheers to these two fine gents on screen. K. Luke. Thank you so much, Dusty Dan. Yeah, uh, he, had a, he had a killer review on uh, Bat 7 the other day. I thought he was spot on with his notes. So really, really appreciate his review. Uh, Dusty, Dan, Dusty Dan is one of the best pals in the game. For sure. Um, yeah, Dan, you get you get this as well, Dan. I love you. I love you. I love you. <laughs> Cheers, Dan. All right, let's go to letter B. Let's see what we got. Oh, I already think I know what I think I know what blend this is. Maybe. Oh wow, this is super sweet. So there was a note that Danny from Bart's on Bourbon Company called out last week that I feel like I'm picking up on this. Man, I get orange peel. <sighs> Smell it again and think watermelon Jolly Rancher. The brightness, okay. Right? <clears throat> I was I thinking can, orange, but I can, it's definitely got that brightness in there. Yeah, I definitely see the orange peel. It's, right. sure. it's very fruit forward. I love the nose on this on this blend. It's so good. Oh wow! What are you thinking, John? That's good. <laughs> totally different than A. This is very front of the palate. Yeah. Like I get this, you get the bright sweetness, and then there's almost like this like vibrant like citrus peel spice thing going on too that I get in there. I, I I'm getting like this really nice toffee note in between, like the fruit forwardness as well. And it's also I think this also has a sneaky, a sneaky long finish as well. It's not I don't think it's a it's not like a super proofy finish, but it's got a nice finish to it. This is good. So it's got this bright pop up front and like front of the tongue. And then it yeah. starts rolling backwards. I see what you mean about that, that kind of toffee caramel like mid palette. And then it just continues like to roll back, you know, just keeps going. Richie Z, I reviewed that one already, dude. You're you're uh you're behind. I reviewed that a while back, dude. Get get on it. Um, if it's a great blend, then I think at this point we're all able to understand that if the youngest is four years, tell us. If it's four to seven years, tell us. <laughs> I'm kind of glad my blend is noting uh, is is oh not in the mix tonight. That's what I'm thinking. He's he's meant to type. Oh, this is a totally different whiskey than A. Right. That's this is what makes it tough though. This is why I need you like in your expertise to help out. <laughs> It's so sweet. It's so fruit forward. It's got a nice finish. It's very balanced. I love this blend. It's got great mid palate weight too. Yeah, right. like the texture of it is. Yeah, I agree. It's like thick in the middle of your tongue. Mm -hmm. That's good. You know, it's All interesting right. to me too, like when you go through the blends and then you start back over at the beginning, because a lot of times that you get some different things that come out to you when you go back through the blends over and over again, you know, you get back to round two. Um, Bob Glass in the house says, having K. Luke batch seven now. Great job, Jonathan. Yeah, Jonathan's been uh, blending yeah. some. So, so, Jonathan, real quick, I mean, have you, did you realize kind of the, now correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like K. Luke right now is still kind of a, um, inside whiskey enthusiast, kind of best kept secret type brand. But the people that love it and the people that have found K. Luke have obviously said a lot of positive things about it, including myself. I absolutely love the blends you're putting together, and they seem to sell really well each and every uh, release. Um, what has been your experience? What What do you think from your perspective as the person who blends uh, these uh, these K. Luke batches? You know, for me, I think that the coolest thing is I wake up in the morning, you know, and I get emails and messages from people on social media that tell me how much they enjoy the blends, you know, how excited they are to go back and taste through them and just, um, 
you know, guys sharing them with their friends, you know, they're sharing them with their dad and just, it just really loving the, uh, the amount of effort we put into the blends to create something so multifaceted. And that's, that's really the love for me of bourbon. When you get something special in the glass, it continue, continues to draw you in for more, right? Like when you get that whiskey and you taste it and you're like, man, I can't wait to have more of this. Like for me, that's, that's what whiskey is all about. And when you get together with a group of friends and you can really sit and share the same love of the bottle and have a good time with it. Um, I always tell people whiskey is great, but you, you got to open the bottles and enjoy them. My choice is you got to pop them. Don't watch them. That's I right. The point of having, you can see behind me are all my barrel picks and K Luke, you know, everything's open. It's all about share the whiskey, enjoy the moment, uh, enjoy what's in the glass. Um, and that's, that's where I think Kaylee really shines is, is the excitement people have had of, of getting each pour and tasting each batch and realizing each batch is different and just sharing their love of it. So, And I think that's kind of the beauty of finding a brand like Kaylee because I feel like the guys that buy the Kaylee, the guys and girls that buy Kaylee, that's what they're doing. They're opening it up. They're buying it to open it up and enjoy it. Kaylee hasn't, you know, it's not in the realm of like a Buffalo Trace or, you know, some of these other you know, high-end, uh, you know, unattainable bottles that people buy just to use as trophies. And they don't drink them. They just sit there. That's what I love about K. Luke and some of the other small brands that, that I've that I've been able to enjoy this year. It's like those kind of, you know, whiskey enthusiast, uh, whiskey tube type of brands that, uh, you know, people buy and they want to crack them open because they want to see what the hell you just blended. And I think that's kind of like the best, uh, like the best part of it. So hopefully it stays that way. I mean, congrats if you get like too big for your britches, but you know, I I like where you're at right now. <laughs> well, man, I appreciate it. You know, for me again, we will never waver from the love of the whiskey and putting the time into the blends to really make it something special. And again, it's never trying to be like, oh, Jason said this is the best batch. We should try to mimic our other batches to you know whatever batch he said was the favorite. Uh, I always tell people with whiskey, you know, when you, whether you're picking out single barrels or creating a blend or whatever you're doing with it, you have to truly believe in what you're doing and stand behind it. And you have to be excited to go and pour that whiskey if it's the last whiskey you get to drink. And that's why I go into every batch. And yeah. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm working on my own stuff now and blending and it, it's tough. So I, I'm with you. It's about really kind of getting into a system and figuring out exactly what you want to blend, how you want to blend it, what you want that taste pro profile to be, how you have to switch it up. And, you know, these blend again contestants, a lot of these guys do it each and every year. So it's always interesting. So, all right, let's go to letter C here. See what we got. You got to stay true to what you believe in, too. You know, you can't be worried about what anyone else thinks or, you know, critics or fads. You, you've truly got to believe in uh, what you put in the bottle and that it's, it's the most exciting whiskey in front of you. And that's, that's my goal in each and every one and Jennifer's, too. She has no problem letting me know through the process if she doesn't think the blend's good. So, no, that's, that's really good advice, honestly. Um, let's see here. All right, so number, number three, another kind of a different blend here. This one, I'm getting a little bit more of a honey type aspect on the nose. You know, it's honey, but it, I think it's more almost like honeycomb. Like it's got this like richness to it too. Like it's got the honey up front, but then there's like something else going on. Like if you get a honeycomb like on a cheese plate. For sure. For sure. Yeah, honeycomb. I could see that, man. I like that. I think I get a little chocolate too in here. Like, definitely get chocolate. You drizzle the, you know, I don't know, if maybe yeah. you had the chocolate, dip the honeycomb in chocolate or something. You know, you kind of get that richness too behind that honey. Yeah. Ben Dramon, did I miss the M and J K Luke pick plug? Are you doing picks yet? Not quite yet. We haven't quite got there. So, okay. you know, was, I mean, I've picked 415 barrels. I've tasted about 1,600 barrels, give or take, over the last decade. So for me with K. Luke, because we have so many different components, I don't ever want the, the component to be like, just trying to focus on one thing. So what I'd love to do is some sort of blends or, you know, maybe like when we do like Toast Bar Rye or like the Keenan, we do those blends and they go into those secondary barrels, maybe doing some of those as single barrels because they definitely taste different. I mean, the Keenan, they were distinctly different between the four cab. Oh, and for sure. And then when you use that barrel second time, they'll be pretty wildly different as well. So, you know, it's, it's trying to stay true to what Kaylee is. Obviously, we had the two 15 years right when we came out. And you'll probably see some, you know, some other, you know, probably 10-year-old plus barrels that I'm really excited about that I think stand alone on their own. Um, but it's all about Kaylee being something special. It's really about our ability to blend and what makes the whiskey special. So there will be some barrels. We're still working on that. So 
I love this. I love number three so much, or letter C, whatever you want to call it. What are your thoughts on that one? This one is hitting everything. Sides of the tongue, front of the palate, finish. Yeah, it's got this like, um, you know, you talked about like in the Keenan, how it kind of has like that big fruit kind of jelly. Like this is like a brighter, like honey orange kind of. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like a, like a spice, on, uh, like a spice tea like type note that it's got. I don't know. There's a lot going on in here. There's a lot of. Do you? I have a. Do you? Do you have an inclination that this could be maybe a burai? You think you got some bourbon and rye mixed in here? I'm not getting a lot of the rye on the palate, but that spice is making me think there's some rye in here. That is so good. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely got that pop in there of that rye. Right? Spice. Yeah, that spice pop is just boom. Yeah, it's uh, there's some cool things going on in this whiskey. This one's actually harder to describe, I think, than the first two. Like it's, there's a lot of layers, a lot of interesting things going on that really work well together. Yeah, it definitely takes you off in a couple different directions. I like what it does with kind of the sides of my tongue. It really kind of makes it tingle. It has a nice heft to it. It's the finish is very very long. That is an incredible blend. Whatever blend that is, that is really good. I I love. I love two, but I think I really love three. I almost feel like three is like a heightened version of two. Like I get some of the yeah. two, but it's like thicker and more mouth coating and just big all around. I could not agree more with that assessment. It, it is. It's like, it's like a more amped up version of what two is. And uh, I still feel it all over my mouth. I mean, just all over the place. Yeah, it's just, it's just lingering. It's si It's still sitting there. That's incredible. All right, let's go to number four. Let's see what we got. Or letter D, I should say. Oh, man, this is sweet. Very sweet. All right, guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow up the chat here a little bit. You guys ready for this? Okay, here we go. Give me, in the chat, your mm. number one Christmas movie of all time. And go. The chat's about to go about 100 miles an hour. Here we go. The nose on this is super – this is candy in a glass. What do you think, John? I get floral, too, in here. Yeah. This this gives me like a Four Roses vibe. Yeah. Right? Uh, let's see. Elf, Home Alone, It's a Wonderful Life, Bad Santa. You don't see that one very often. Uh, what about Christmas Vacation? <laughs> oh, that one already popped up. Prescription Bourbon had that on lock. There he is. He had that. Um, yeah, Wonderful Life, Die Hard, Elf, Christmas Vacation, Home Alone, Bad Santa, again, from Warren Smith. White Christmas. So this movie is probably the most polarizing Christmas movie I've ever talked to anyone about. People seem to either love it or hate it. What is it with White Christmas? Is it just because it's like a musical? People don't dig it? Like, I don't, uh, I don't know. Like, I've, there's such a, like, a distinct line for White Christmas. People either love that movie or they can't stand it. There are some Christmas movies you watch, and you're like, ah, I could watch that. But White Christmas seems to be one of those ones that it's like, I'm definitely not watching that shit. I don't know. What are your What are your favorites, John? A Christmas movie? Oh, I mean, for me, like the one, the one movie I can sit down and watch oh. over is Christmas Vacation. No question. I mean, it's you can't relate to that movie. So I. Uh, what goes on? <laughs> Cameron Lochner is on that side of the fence where he says Die Hard is not a Christmas movie. It came out in movie theaters in July. Okay. Santa Claus 2 in Bruges. <laughs> okay. Obviously the Grinch. Obviously. Um, so D is very concentrated in flavor. There's a lot of just potent richness going on in letter d what do you think you know i get that kind of floral candy note up front um and then it turns kind of dry the only thing for me for me for d compared to the others especially compared to c is i don't get the back end weight it's very front of the tongue forward for me yeah they're compared to b and and c not much of a finish on this one um 
I mean, there is a finish, but it's not. It doesn't have as much depth as the other two. I really like it up front. Like I said, I kind of get that floral candy yeah. pop, and then you know get the dry spice. But then for me, it just kind of drops off. Where like C, especially then B, we're very lingering on the back end. Yeah, yeah. That the, finish, the finishes on on B and C are hard to contend with. They're really good. Um, oh yes, yeah, I just watched Scrooge last night. Love that one. Shauna Marie D. This is why. This is why, Shauna. That's right. You're right here. Gremlins, I think is a Christmas movie. Love that movie. Um, Scarface was a Christmas movie. I just think if like anyone sees a Christmas tree in a movie, they automatically make it a Christmas movie. It doesn't automatically make it a Christmas movie. I mean, I love Scarface. I don't know that associated as Christmas movie, but uh... Jason, how are you keeping Grinch so quiet? Looks like he might be planning an attack. Yeah, he's gonna steal all my whiskey. I know he is. Um, Die Hard is Christmas movie for me, at least. You. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. Um, uh, let's see. This is so nerve wracking. Of the three described, mine feels like A, which was good at the time and gets it keeps getting worse. <laughs> Andy Smith. Uh, all right, I'm sorry. I, I always feel like for the blenders that are watching, it does it, it can get nerve wracking. So, all right, let's go to the last one. But then I have a very important question to ask you. Ooh, D. I'm getting getting a little bit of that watermelon on D as well. You know what I get in this is like some cherry Dr. Pepper like this. Oh, yeah, I can see that. Ooh, that's a proofy beast. It just singed my nose hairs. <laughs> Look at Adam Dorman. Extremely. <laughs> Oh, the palate on that is uh, very fruity, a little funky. Wow. Mm. Mm. That's probably the most unique blend, I think, out of the five. How how you feeling about this one, John? It's it's yeah, different. I get like uh, like like dark cordial cherry on this one. I uh, it's different. It's definitely big. It's big. It's big, it's bold. But again, I think this is having what D had, where it's big and bold up front and mid palette, and then not much on the finish, though. I, I really like the nose on this one. I really like the up front, but again, it just doesn't care on the back end weight. Yep. I so would... for me, if, if I, if, if for me, and this, if this is a blend, I'm like, okay, you know, for me, it's got the kind of like cola, it's got the cherry notes, but it's like, how do we add that, like, caramel toffee like back end you know and kind of bring it back around and back into the palette trying to find maybe either older barrels or maybe just more complex kind of back end heavy barrels to put in this blend aaron c ecbp c923 is taking four pours and now i see it neck pour even uh even dizzy was rough for me um i could see that with c923 i mean it is 133 proof it's got a high proof point it's got high age that thing just opens up incredibly well. Um, I mean, I I don't see many other. I don't see a world where that doesn't land as bourbon of the year for a lot of people because not only the age in it, because of the flavors and because of the value. It's got all three things you look for in a really good whiskey. Um, let's see. I love ECBP C nine twenty three, but there are a lot of variations due to dump dates. Yeah, I mean, you're going to get that, especially with small batches. Jason, how has the Discovery 11 opened up for you? If anything, it's gotten more citrusy for me, Holden. Uh, more of that citrus comes out, which makes sense because the base, a majority of that blend is wild turkey. So when you think about that and the citrus you get, citrus and cherry, it's actually just coming more to the forefront. But I love the spice of that, and I love the um, the flavors overall of, uh, of, of the Discovery 11. I can't wait to try that Discover 11. I haven't had a chance to taste that one yet, but I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really it's a it's it's the first alt Kentucky blend they've done in a little while and it's so good. Um 
Uh, I, let's see. I won't. I won't taste it till probably uh, batch eight. You know, Caleb will run it blind. That would be one of ours. We'll run in the final flight of blinds. Um, so I won't taste it before then because you know it's hard for me to find like whiskeys that read other people what they're excited about to run in blind tasting. So we really try not to taste those new exciting whiskeys that people are excited about until we get into a blind flight against yeah. Kid Luke. So I'll have to wait a little bit before I taste it. Yeah. So so here's the thing about Discovery Eleven. I felt like I liked it more in the beginning than I'm liking it now. Because right. I felt like in the beginning it was a lot richer and a little bit more oaky, but as it's worked its way down the bottle, more of the citrus notes have come out, and it's become a little bit more not as multi-dimensional as I thought it was when I first tried it. That's that's the only knock I could give it. Uh, James Morgan, Fred passed it by without comment. To me, that didn't say a lot. Um, which whiskey are you talking about, James? Is that are you talking about Discovery Eleven? Um, I'm curious. Um, please don't take this the wrong way, but Jonathan looks exactly like Johnny Boy Soprano. <laughs> I don't think I don't. I think that's a compliment, to be honest. Yeah, told you my family imported olive oil before getting into the liquor business in 1933. So you know. Oh, James Morgan said yes, sir. Oh, the Discovery Eleven. So he didn't really talk about it too much. Um, I'm curious where in his tasting that he tasted that one. Was it like the last round when like his palate has to be shot? I'm, I'm I don't know how he does it. I don't either. Um, that's a lot of that's a lot of tasting. That's a lot of tasting. Um, would you choose Disco Ten or Eleven now because of how Eleven diminished to you? I would have to revisit Dis uh, Discovery Ten again, to be honest. I mean, I'll still always love Discovery Eleven because it is majority of the blend is you know my favorite distillery, um, but um, I would have to put it up against Ten again to see how it would come out. And, you know, I'm going to do all this, guys, probably on Patreon and also a uh, YouTube-only, uh, members-only stream where I'm going to be – I'm actually going to be putting – so, Jonathan, I'll probably invite you to this if you want. I'm going to be putting uh, batches four, five, and six of K. Luke all in the blind to see which is my favorite because I think that one of those will end up going to my top tier, like, blind tasting. Awesome. I'll, probably, I'll probably have the Hardens Creeks again as well, tasting those, going to my top – which is one of my favorite going to the top end and doing a bunch of that to see where they fall. I, I do think a K Luke will make my top 10 this year. I'm like off the, off the top of my head. I'm thinking it could be four, but five and six also were really good in their own right. So I'm not sure how that's going to go. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah, man. You know, for me, it's, it's, I tell you all the time, you got to taste them blind and see what you think, you know, exactly. and, and that's what you, you have to, to, yeah. what's, to what's in the glass, right? Don't worry about the, age or proof or the hype or how, how much you paid for it right how does the whiskey drink in the glass and at the end of the day it's <laughs> prescription bourbon says fred's k luke batch four was tainted he hated it that's interesting yeah i'm not sure what happened with that one i gotta i'm gonna have to taste that bottle and see yeah i and wonder or won his blind tasting uh <laughs> summer, so yeah because he loved that bottle at first when i saw it yeah so i'm wondering why it didn't do so well in, in the tasting tonight would yeah, spend, so we'll see. Yeah, would you spend the 150 on a Russell's 13 or the Disco 11? Oh, Russell's 13, not even close. Um, ECBP 9 C923 was in the second round for Fred. He was gushing over Larceny C923. You know what? That makes sense because Fred doesn't really like oak too much. And I feel like Elijah Craig definitely has more oak presence than the Larceny does. So that actually makes sense to me. Um, okay. So this is what we're going to do, Jonathan. We're going to taste them real quick in reverse order. All right. And just in your quick impressions, start picking out a couple of favorites. Maybe pick your top three, and then we'll go from there. Sound good? Sure. Are we going to just taste through all of them and then kind of discuss them afterward? Yeah. We'll, we'll right. do that. And then uh, on top of that, before you taste it, I got to ask you, it's a thing. It's a blend getting thing. It started last year. I need to ask you, what is your ultimate favorite peanut butter and jelly sandwich? <coughs> ultimate favorite, huh? I'm talking about the type of bread you use, toasted, untoasted, creamy versus crunchy peanut butter, type of jam. Is it jelly? Is it white bread, wheat bread? I We want all of it and go. You know, I've never gotten super crazy. I think for me it's just standard uh... – 
you know, I guess we, we keep honey wheat bread here at home. So it would be that toasted, just creamy peanut butter, classic grape jelly. That usually so, so honey, maybe, apple, maybe apple. So honey wheat bread toasted. Yeah. So you like a toasted bread? Yep. Uh, and then you said creamy, peanut, a little butter, bit. creamy peanut butter. Do you have a, do you have a specific brand you like? Um, I mean, we just, just standard Jif peanut butter. All right. Standard Jif. Yeah. And then what'd you say? Just grape jelly? Grape or we, we, I guess apple jelly probably. I should, I should revert that to apple jelly. Oh, apple I mean, jelly. Peanut butter and jelly, but apple jelly is most of what we do for breakfast. So probably you might, apple. you might be the first apple jelly guy that I've heard so far. Yeah. <coughs> Wait, apple butter or apple jam no, or apple jelly? Apple jelly. Apple jelly. Apple jelly. Okay. I'm not watching Fred this year because he didn't include 13th Colony Double Ups. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, just so you know, have Jeep Will Whiskey. That will not be on my list because I didn't get a bottle of it this year. However, I will do an honorable mention because I did get a sample from 13th Colony, and it's freaking delicious. So, all right. All right, John. Let's taste through them real quick here. We'll go in reverse order. Go from uh, work your way from E back to A, and we'll uh, we'll pick out. Let's pick our top three here. All right. And I know all the blenders watching right now are probably like, oh, shit, here it comes. Here we go. It's time. And you'd be right. Three of you guys are going back to the North Pole. Sorry. Yeah, E, something something went awry with E. I'm, I'm not sure what happened with E. I'm not digging it. Yeah. Love it on the news. Fall short of the palate. Yep. Chris Buzalencia says Team Apple Jelly. All right. You got an Apple Jelly fan with uh, Mr. Chris Buzalencia. Love it. You get a little toasty richness, a little brightness, right? Eric Sawyer. Oh, you're a South Pole elf. Oh. You know what? Coming off of coming off of E, D is actually pretty damn good. <laughs> I still find it a little dry. It's dry, and the finish is just lacking, unfortunately. Yeah. All right. So, I mean, we get back to C here, which is really delicious. Oh, C is so good. C is so good. No still checks in. I would, yeah, I would buy, I would pay a pretty amount of money to get, to get number, to get letter C. That is such a good blend. Um, orange marmalade and PB on toasted sourdough for Mr. Popham. Don't watch him. I like it. Kenneth Rathburn, single Rickhouse CNF or four roses, 135th. Damn. Uh, Kenneth, the only, the only way I can help you make that decision is, if you like sweet and funky, go CNF. If you like oak and you like the age and you like a little bit more baking spice, then go Four Roses. That's the only way I can like split those up. Whichever one you like more, then go with that one. Again, Four Roses is damn good. I had some last. Oh, I do. I love the Four Roses one thirty fifth. I text Brent and told him I said, Brent, this is this is rock solid, man. But. I don't know if you've had the Camp Nelson single rickhouse um, CNF from Wild Turkey. It is a flavor bomb. There is just so much happening on the palate with that bourbon. I haven't, but you know, I love Wild Turkey too. I spent a lot of time in uh, in those warehouses with Eddie Russell tasting barrels. So, yeah, yeah I, I love tasting barrels with Bruce. He he um, he has such great insight to like the warehouses. I just love talking to him. Uh, Darrell is already freaking out, so we'll see what happens. Um, a letter B here. B, B, you're right. B does remind me of C a little bit, but B is a more fruity, fruit forward version of C. C is more amped up, and but both have an incredible finish. Mm. Let's go to A. Haven't had A in a, in a minute here. Yeah, B's really good too. A has like that dusty, funky finish to it. I really like it too. All right. I think I have my top three. 
in no particular order, it's A, B, and C to me. Um, D and E are good, but the finish is just lacking, unfortunately. I agree with you. Do you? Yeah. Yep. Oh, okay. Yep. I really think... Man. And I think A is so different than B and C also. What's that? A is so different than B and C. For me, yeah. B and C... You know what B and C remind me of? When I go to like somewhere like, like 1792, like Barton... Uh huh. Girls, it's like okay, this one we're gonna do, you know, as a as a ball and bond, you know, hundred proof, and then you know this one we're gonna go as a uh, you know one twenty five. Like to me, that's like B and C, right? Like it's it's just B is a more fine version almost of C, uh, and A is just totally different than the both of them. Yeah, A is the outlier. I think B is more refined, but I think C has the flavor and the finish. That's that's where I'm at. But I think also I can make a case that A is the most unique, though, right? Again, it's kind of got that nougat funkiness to it. Yeah, it's that new, it's that nougat, chocolatey, funky, like malty finish. It's got. All right, John. So this is what we're gonna do. Um, we're gonna eliminate D and E. So take those out of the mix. Yep. Okay. So D and E are now are out. So it comes down to A, B, and C. One of these has to go home, and two will make it to the final four. Oh yeah. All right. Yeah, sorry, John. I know it's tough, but <laughs> this is this is why I needed other palettes to help me like to help me with this shit. Because mm -hmm. these blends each and every year are getting better and better and better. Um Have Jeep Will Whiskey A is unctuous. That's a that's a highly underutilized. I think the only other person I, I hear using that word is uh, Guy Fieri on home on um the Food Network. He always uses that word unctuous. For three hundred dollars, is Russell's thirteen worth it? CJ Miller, I think it is, but I'm a turkey guy, and I think that bottle. Oh wait, no, Russell's thirteen. I'm sorry. I thought that was the single Rick House for three hundred bucks. Nah. I probably wouldn't buy it for three hundred. I would pay three hundred for the Camp Nelson. I would save your money and try to find that instead, for sure. Oh man! All right, I'm gonna taste these each time one more one more time through here and figure it out. Mm. Oh, I got my top two. Yeah. Mm. Oh my God, C is just stupid. I, I I have to go B and C. I know A is more unique, but B and C have everything I want in a whiskey. Yeah, you can B and C. You've got stars for me, so <laughs> there you go. <clears throat> All right, but I think going back through them again, I don't think A holds up to B and C. Um, I I agree, um, and I, I think that also had to do with order. I mean, you know, I mean, you're a you're kind of a renowned blender now. I mean, you know that first barrel, that first glass you taste, always could end up being kind of a favorite in the beginning, just because it's the first one you have. But once you start tasting through stuff, things change. Um, a is probably the most unique. And it is a favorite. It's a shame it's going to get eliminated right now because it is really good. However, B and C just has too much going on from front to back to be eliminated. So um, it's going to be A going home. Yep. And B and C going through to the final four. All right, John, you ready for this? You ready to find out what's in these blends? Yeah, let's see what we got here. Well, we're not going to know what's in B and C because those are going through to the end. Okay. But we will find out what's in A, D, and E. So here we go. My man, the Grinch, has all the answers. Here he is. Let's shake him out of him. Right here. 
He's like, don't touch my book. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. Here we go. Everyone's freaking out. I already know. All right. Letter A. Wait, first let me get the uh, blend envelopes here because um, everyone does submit their envelopes with uh, with their blend components, and we only read them if they get eliminated. Um, so, John, just for your information, just so you know, in years past, I've allowed anyone to blend anything that they want. That's an American whiskey. Uh, this year, I eliminated single barrel, store picks, or group picks because I want people to be able to possibly – um, we make this blend as much as possible. I think that's pretty cool. All right. So letter A goes to where's where's his blend here? The one and only. Sorry, buddy. Adam Dorman. Adam Dorman with his blend named Dirty Glasses and Old Bar Stools. Adam, you were so freaking close to the final four this year. Ah, uh, let's find out what's in Adam's blend. All right, I can't wait to see. There we go. So, so real quick, now that you now that we tasted A, do you have any guesses what's in it? Do you think you have any guesses what's in that blend? Man, I don't know. I, I would say there's got to be some more maltiness in there. Um, there's something malty in here. Yeah, for sure. But there's there's just a it's it's the finish that didn't hold up. Let's see what's in this blend. Almost like you have some like town branch or something, just something different in there. All right, so here it is: dirty glasses and old bar stools. This is not a very complicated blend, folks. This is three whiskeys that you can probably recreate on your own to see what happens to it. It is two parts Elijah Craig Barrel Proof A123. Two parts Pikesville rye, and one part Wild Turkey Kentucky Spirit, which is a a shelfer version, which wasn't a uh, which wasn't a pick. Um, it came in at 114 proof, and that kind of blows my mind because I would never have guessed. Do you think the Pikesville rye gave it that funkiness? I don't know. You know, I get that lingering spice in the back end on this one, so maybe that's where that you know. Maybe that's where that was. Yeah. Um, Turkey, Elijah Craig. I didn't try, I don't think I had the Elijah Craig A from this year. Yeah, Adam, there's a funkiness that came out, uh, while those, while that whiskey was intermingling that just kind of threw it off a little bit. It just unbalanced it. And it's funny too, cause I don't, I don't remember tasting that in your blend previously. That's, that's crazy. Um, again, but this is what happens with blend again blend sit longer stuff happens in that jar you're not sure what's going to happen as it sits longer so um yeah, more old school turkey funk in there you know Should that you just, i think that's what it is the old school turkey <laughs> funk. that's such a good that's such a good uh that's such a good call out the turkey funk maybe took over a little bit but not in a good way all right letter d let's go to letter d that belongs to where is it where is it? Andy Smith with a bourbon train to Lynchburg. So that makes me think. Huh. He's got some Jack Daniels in there. Let's let's see what's in his blend. Where's letter uh, where's letter D here? Letter D. See what we got in this blend. <laughs> All right. Holy. Oh, okay. Interesting. A bourbon train to Lynchburg, 124.6 proof. You ready for this blend? Equal parts. Equal parts. Jack Daniels, single barrel, barrel proof rye. ECBP, uh, Elijah Craig barrel proof. C922. B523, B522, and A123, all in the same blend. So he had four Elijah Craig Barrel Proof bottles and one Jack Daniels single barrel barrel proof rye in there. So, wow. sorry, not a rye, but a single barrel uh, Tennessee whiskey. Dude, that's crazy. Especially the floral notes in there. 
Yeah, but it never thought it, it got man. What you think it was that high corn mash bill that kind of gave off that floor that floral note? I mean, tasting it now, I mean, I could definitely see Heaven Hill, but it's amazing that all those all those whiskeys together. How in the world does the finish fall off, Jonathan? Like, explain that to me. <laughs> you know? That's crazy. I mean, there's some really cool things going on in this blend. It just, it just on the back end. Yeah. All right, guys. The last one, letter E. Letter E belongs to the one and only. Uh, is that his? Uh... going to make you guys wait and simmer. Sorry. John, uh, what are you doing for Christmas, buddy? <laughs> oh, you know, I'm going to sit, have a little, little wine, a little whiskey, cook some food. You staying, you staying home for things? You, you staying home for Christmas? Oh, yeah. You know, I work retail, so this is a chaotic month for us. Oh, I can imagine. I got to come down and visit your store. I want, I want all the goodies in your store. All right. We need to hang out and get some whiskey together is what we need to do. Uh, yeah, hell yeah. We need to we need to blend some shit together, I think, too. All right. The last one. Letter E goes to. I can't wait to see what's in this one. <laughs> Mr. Danny Lopez. No JD12, no care. Which means the top two blenders going to the final four is the defending champion, Eric Sawyer, and Mr. Darrell Stewart. Getting to the final four. Congratulations, guys. <laughs> that is awesome. So I can't awesome. wait to find out what's in B C. Well, we're not gonna know what's in B and C until the finals, unfortunately. But we are about to find out what was in E. So let's see here. Let's go to Danny Lopez's blend. The letter E. This was the. This yeah, this one had so much good stuff going on up front. I think there's a weeder in there. I'm, I'm guessing a weeder. So let's see here. Let's see what we got in here. All right. I made this because I wasn't able to score a bottle of Jack Daniels 12 and said the hell with it. And made a blend that I thought as a nice consolation minus the hunt. My buddy, the bourbon jerk, gave me a couple of ounces of Jack Daniels 12 to try so I could compare. So this is from uh, Danny Lopez. So 60% of this blend is Jack Daniels single barrel barrel proof. 20% um, of it is Eagle Rare. Holy shit. There's and, the cherry. Yeah. And 20%, the rest of the 20%. Is Jack Daniels Old Number Seven, which is an 80 proof whiskey. Thanks again for giving us an opportunity to blend and complete, Jason. Wow. Would have never guessed in a million. Well, I mean, it actually makes sense now. But honestly, Danny, I think that the Jack Daniels 80 proof killed your blend. It it killed the finish. It killed. What was the proof in this one, Jason? He didn't have a proof for it, but I mean, you okay. can kind of. Kind of maybe figured it out. I mean, 129.7. Then you have 20. So that's 60% of the blend. Then you have 20% equal parts of Eagle Rare and Jack Daniels. Eagle Rare is 90 and Jack Daniels is 80. So what do you think that would bring that blend down to? Like 110-ish, you would think? Well, the finish drops off so much. I mean, I, I love the cherry kind of like Dr. Pepper cordial thing going on up front in this. On the news, yeah. and the palette, it just drops off in the back end. Yeah, I, I think it's a super impressive blend because not only did he use Jack Daniels barrel proof, but he fuck the dude used the black label, which that's pretty crazy. That's ballsy. That's so I, I mean, I started off drinking before I got into bourbon. Was, was old right. JD for seven. <laughs> he gets an A for effort there. I, I mean. I think now you're kind of getting like the banana chips and some of the other stuff that you get in the Jack Daniels uh, 7, uh, old number 7. But, 
that is a um, that's a pretty ballsy blend. That that wins a ballsy blend of the uh, of the year right there. Man, I love it up front. I think if it just could have continued on to the mid and back end. Yeah, something something about the the finish. It just needs more spice and more finish. I think the the eighty proof whiskey just killed the blend. Unfortunately, it just no uh, no finish. It just dies out. So you should put some uh, Elijah Craig Girl proof or something in there. Get some of that caramel toffee kind of big note. There you go, Danny. There are some tips. Add a little ECBP to that blend. See what happens. Um, man, we have two big names going to the finals, guys. Eric Sawyer, the defending champion. Darrell Stewart with Bootsy's blend going to the finals as well. Eric Sawyer, Darrell Stewart in the finals. Congrats, fellas. Man, what can I say here? Um, Jonathan, I can't thank you enough for coming on. I know your time is valuable. You're a busy guy. And um, I think what you're doing in the whiskey world is absolutely phenomenal. I've loved pretty much every blend that you've put out. This Keenan, uh, <laughs> this Keenan Cabernet finish uh, whiskey that you put out is unbelievably good. So if you guys haven't got it yet, go to Sealbox. It is available. Jonathan, uh, where can everybody find you? Find out what you're working on. Let them let them know. Yeah, man, keep up with us on, uh, you can go to KayleigWhiskeyCompany.com, uh, join our newsletter, we'll let you know we've got uh, new things releasing, um, if we're doing tastings or events out in the market, you can find us in retail stores, uh, Kentucky, Louisiana, Mississippi, uh, one store in Wyoming, at uh, in Pinedale, at Country Lane Liquor, um, in Tennessee, you can get find our blends on Sealbox. Uh, Shared Pours already sold out, but Shared Pours is our new partner for online sales. Um, Sealbox still currently has Batch Seven and the Keenan. And again, man, I just I appreciate all the love from you guys in the in the bourbon community. You know, all the customers reach out to me every day, let me know how much you're enjoying what we're doing. Um, yep. You know, K Luke is the spirit of blending. That's what it's all about, and uh, I, I just love all the enthusiasm from the consumers and. Uh, Again, I mean, just like you, I just love to sit and drink great bourbon and share it with my family and friends. So, Jonathan, next year, my New Year's resolution is to go down and visit your store and drink some bourbon with you. Okay, I'm telling you right now. Let's get together and hang out, and uh, hopefully, we'll get that uh, mash and drum K. Luke blend working here before too long. Oh, I love that idea. <laughs> get put some together. Maybe we we'll get Scott. Maybe get a couple of guys together and uh, do something fun. So, dude, we got to get uh, me, Scott. Maybe get pop them down there. We could we could put together a, a hitter of a blend for the for the group. So um, I know Troy hanging out, pop him a, a cigar and bourbon night. Anyway, I've been talking about it forever. He doesn't believe it's ever going to happen. So. so so let's do that. Let's do let's make it a a blending and cigar night. I think that'd be incredible. It's my kind of work, you know. Yeah, hell yeah, man. All right, guys. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Really appreciate it. Again, thanks to Jonathan Mezano uh, from K Luke for uh, for coming on and being an amazing judge tonight. Congrats again to Eric and Darrell for moving on to the final four. Uh, you guys will be part of the finals going forward. Um, and, you know, what can I say, guys? I just want to say thank you for another incredible year. Um, I should be live again next week, barring any issues uh, for the second round of the Fab Five uh, for the right side of the bracket. But if I don't talk to you at any point, guys, please have an amazing holiday, a Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, all the – all the uh, all the all the holidays that kind of get involved in uh, that they get called out in this 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 type of season and in the season that we are in. Absolutely love you guys. I can't thank you enough for the support. And as I always say, it's not about the whiskey; it's the people you share it with. Have a happy holiday, a merry Christmas, and I will see you guys next week right here on the Master and Drum. Love you guys. If you're a patron, stick around. I'm gonna be doing a patron only live. And if you're not. Head on, on over to uh, Women of Whiskeys. They're going live right now. So cheers, and I'll see you next week right here on the Master Drum. Take care, guys. Cheers, guys. Thanks, Jason. <laughs>